Hello, welcome to Minds and Money Online Connect Virtual Mining Conference. I'm Niels Christensen, editor with Kitco News. Traditionally, I'm a gold guy, but today I get to talk about the other yellow metal, uranium. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to have this discussion with this uh, uh, renowned panel. Uh, joining me today is uh, William Thompson Ma from Mastiff Capital, Warren Irwin from Russo Asset Management, Kim Baruch, Kim Baruch from ISO Energy, and Daniel Major from Govex Uranium. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, thanks great to be here, Neil. Thanks. thanks for moderating. Yeah, thanks very much, Neil. Um, so let's let's get into this. I, I think my, my first question I wanted to ask for to directly to Warren and William, um, what is the, the the uranium market like? Um, if you can give us just like a, a really quick uh, overview of of supply demand fundamentals, what's driving prices? You know how what, what's the health of the markets? Okay, I'll I'll start here then quickly. Uh... The uranium market is um, a pretty pretty messed up market right now. The uh, prices have been below uh, below cost of production for the major producer uh, major producer like uh, like Cameco for a while, and a lot of the producers smaller than Cameco. So you've got an instance where there's there's a substantial amount of um, um, money being lost currently in production with some of these people who have uh, mines going, and the Chinese uh, have some mines that are operating. Um, probably costing them about $70 a pound to produce uranium. The price, the spot price of uranium is around $30. So it's a pretty of a messed up market. And hence, uh, therein lies the opportunity. Um, the cure for low prices is low prices. And what's unique about this market is there's about, depending on the numbers you use, let's say 100, to give you a sense of magnitude, around 150 million pounds of consumption, around 120 million pounds of production. So the, the key to the uranium market from other markets is about a 30 million pound, that's plus or minus 10 million pounds, depending on what's going on with, with things that uh, seems to be coming from the secondary market, people with excess supplies of uranium. So it's a very unique situation. Uh, it's a, in a state of flux. It is not a stable market. It cannot stay this way. Uh, we need higher prices in order to, uh, to meet the demand for future uranium. So um, that's why there's a number of people still bullish on the sector. William, what's your investment case? Yeah, so I would I would just echo a lot of what Warren said, and I would add to it that uh, you know at this point it's become pretty unique. You have people like Cameco and Kaz Adamprom, the two largest producers, actually going out in the market and buying you know secondary supplies, trying to sort of tidy it up. Um, I'm not sure if I could come up with another commodity where the actual producers are buying in the secondary market. I'm not sure I've ever seen it before. Uh, so there's you know, there's a lot of efforts being made right now to try and clean it up and, and to get that price back up to a point where uh, we can bring on new supply. And I think in the wake of last year, uh, you had several uranium mines either shut down uh, for good, uh, or in the case of people like Cameco, at least temporarily. Uh, and that's just sort of exacerbated some of the supply demand, uh, demand dynamics that Warren mentioned. Do we know what the true though supply and demand dynamic is? I mean, it is uh, an opaque market, and and I know uh, BMO is is forecasting uh, what an eighteen percent decline in supply this year compared to last year. Um, what does the, the the supply demand fundamentals look like for uranium? Yeah, on the uh, the good thing about it is there's only one there's one key opaque part of the market. On the uh, supply side, everybody you know, has a good handle on what mines are producing what, uh, what their mine lives are, things like that. The only thing we don't have control of recently has been COVID with the COVID shutdowns. So that's sort of on the production side. On the demand side, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. And again, uh, depending on political whims of the day and different things, uh, whether reactors get shut down or not, you can, it's tough to predict that, but uh, you know how many reactors are out there, you know their capacity, you know how much they're gonna be using. So you have a good handle on uh, possibly better than many commodities. You know exactly who's using it and how much they're gonna use and how much they're gonna need. And then you also have a rough sense as to which reactors are being built. So you have a pretty good handle on, on production and consumption. The big mystery, the big black hole for everybody and everybody's trying to predict this is uh, where's this 30 plus or minus million pounds coming from? 
today and where it will be coming from in the future and at what point will that get tidied up and then we're looking at a massive supply deficit. And um, that's, that's really the bull, bull case for uranium is um, people are starting to believe that this uh, 30 million pounds is starting to, starting to get a little tighter. And uh, so we'll see what happens in the next little while. I think that um, unlike some, I mean, you might call uranium a niche commodity, uh, unlike other commodities, uh, the regulation around production and consumption of uranium is so significant that finding uh, supply and demand numbers uh, is relatively straightforward uh, in the grand scheme of things. And the number of mines, you know, it just, there aren't that many globally. And so you can count them up pretty easily. Um, so unlike other metals, I think tracking the supply and demand situation is a little more, uh, a little clear, a little more clear. Uh, but again, the, the secondary market and the recontracting of utilities uh, is, is opaque. Um, and that, that's an area where you know there's there are open questions. Yeah, Neil, Niels, maybe I'll just just jump in quick. But I mean, on the supply demand fundamentals, I mean, at the end of the day, these gentlemen are all right. Like, the the fundamentals have been improving greatly over the last few years. And we had this, you know, really, it's been a ten year down super cycle, you know, following Fukushima. And uh, I, I would even maybe add to to Warren's numbers a bit. You know, if you look at like the UXC and Trade Tech numbers, which are kind of a couple of the leading. Uh, publishers of the price and 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 market uh, studies in, in the industry, they probably look at maybe even you know 180 million pounds of of, of annual demand and and kind of more of a 120 million pounds of supply last year. So the, that deficit last year was closer to like 60 million pounds, in fact. And 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 a lot of that you know is building on what Warren said. It's because not only was there curtailment following Fukushima um, over time, it took some time, and 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 that's why we've had such a long super cycle, but. Um, at the end of the day, we've also had the COVID piece has come in, added to that curtailment. You've got MacArthur River, the world's largest, highest grade, you know, uranium mine in the world in, in northern Saskatchewan here, having been shut for three years already. So those demand, those, those fundamentals are there. And then the other piece I would just add while you're on the fundamentals is what's really important to look at is what are the requirements of the utilities and have they bought their uranium yet? And, and right now you're looking at probably even by 2025, uh, utilities are still probably about a third uncommitted in their requirements and two thirds uncommitted by 2030, which is, is really a huge number because it, there's a long lead time on this buying. So not only is there, you know, a, a lack of supply out there, you know, going forward, there's, there's a lot of buying left to be done, uh, which, you know, William also alluded to. So uh, the fundamentals are really uh, very positive and supportive of the, of the market going forward. I'll just and, okay, add I just want to add one other comment in there, just on the comment regarding secondary. A big part of that secondary is um, inventories coming down from utilities, and you see that reported every year. So for the last three years, the utilities have been selling down their inventories, and they can only sell their inventories down for so long until the cupboard is bare. The other part of the secondary has been the enrichment and conversion markets as well. And that's been evidenced already by the price of enrichment and uh, conversion margins going up already. So the front, the back end of the market's already reacted to the supply constraints that are coming through. So, you know, while we're not quite sure what the exact numbers are, there is a, a pretty rough guide of where we are and we're already seeing those responses in the market. So it's just feeding its way down to where we are, which is the primary uranium production. Well, and that actually brings me to my next question in that, you know, so we have this this looming supply crunch, you know, this uh, almost crisis uh, sort of, you know, if, if I can put words in you guys' mouths. But um, how does this uh, impact the production, you know, the, the, the producers, the explorers, um, you know, because it, it, it feels like some of the things that I've heard is that, you know, prices are still too low for a, a lot of new production to come online. Um, so is it is it a crowded market for um, uh, uh, producers and, and uranium uh, explorers? Uh, well, relative to the past cycle, I think we're 500 stocks uh, in the last peak and we're down to about 50. So, so the room is a lot less crowded than before. Um, I think the reality is, yes, we need the prices to go a lot higher. Talking to the utilities, they understand that as well. Um, they're able to find some material at the moment, so they're willing to play their cards on that. 
you know, but what it does give us, and we're all seeing it, is the impetus to be able to get our projects into production. If you're already permitted like we are, then obviously, you know, it's down to just price. Can we get there? If you're not permitted, then obviously you're going to have to wait to sort out your permits as well to go forward. So you've got a range of projects out there in different parts, whether they're those that were shut down in the last, as the cycle collapsed after 2011, um, are getting ready, uh, preparing themselves. Most of them closed when uranium was still over $50. Um, so, you know, you expect them to want to go back over $50 before they turn up. There are the new producers, uh, developers like ourselves who are getting ourselves ready, working through final feasibility studies, looking at securing offtakes. You know, we're all jockeying for position. But I think the reality is, and it comes back to Warren's comment, you know, you, if you look at secondary inventories as reported by UXC, they are looking at them declining from 60 million pounds down to about 20 million pounds over the next six years. That's three cigar, um, cigar lakes will disappear from the market. By 2030, Cigar Lake itself will also disappear from the market. So we need to find between now and 2030, four mines the size of one of the largest uranium mines in the world currently operating. So that gives you a sense of the problem. At the same time, the market price isn't there for us yet. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would echo that. I mean, you are gonna need a lot of uranium. So there's room for a lot of, of, of people to come into the space, Niels. I think what might be a little bit different than even the last time around where you saw 500, 1,000 companies is I think, I think people will be a little bit more cautious. And when I say people, I mean utilities, the buyers, the investors. I think they'll also be looking for the, the best properties, the best companies with the most economic uh, viable deposits. Because I think, you know, having gone through the last cycle where, you know, we had a big run up and then a lot of these companies just went away. Even utilities made some, you know, some commitments to companies that that didn't last that long, you know, in a bit of a down cycle. Now, I think the cycle we're going into is, is a very long, sustainable, um, positive cycle, for, like for, for a very long time, given, you know, the, the, the narrative around climate change and everything. But you'll still have some ebbs and flows. And so I think people will look for, you know, those those uranium juniors, those explorers that are finding the best projects, the most economic and and in some of the better uh, geopolitical uh, uh, locations around the world as well. well and I, I guess this just, is this is oh, oh, sorry. sorry, just following on that, I think that one of the differences between this time around and last time around, uh, or at least uh, somewhat of a difference, um, is that uh, while we may not be building a lot of new uh, nuclear powered facilities in, say, the West, uh, they certainly are in emerging markets. In China, uh, India is certainly going to ramp up their production. And, and unlike the last time where you had more of a supply crunch, now we have both a supply crunch and uh, what hopefully looks like a demand, growth in demand. Um, and that should sustain uh, the trend, I think, for a little while longer at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. And you have, That's you have people. <clears throat> to give people a sense of those numbers, <clears throat> there's about 440 plus or minus reactors uh, in operation with um, the la latest numbers I pulled off the internet last night from some of the big associations was there's approximately 50 under construction. What's interesting to remember about these, these two is <clears throat> when you start up a new reactor, it's kind of like, uh, you know, getting a new car, you need to fill the tank up with gas. So we're looking at sometimes uh, you know, a double or, or higher um, consumption the initial year of a startup. So a startup is a big deal. The other important thing too, when I looked at historically, um, did my analysis on a lot of the consumption, um, the, the new reactors that are being built are larger than the current um, stable of 440. So if you're having a double whammy. And, and uh, so what we have, we have here is we have 50 new reactors on a base of 440 being, being constructed. They're bigger reactors, and when they, they fire up the first year, they'll need they'll need uh, double consumption of uranium to fill the tank. So uh, <laughs> I, I have rarely seen in, in my career so many fundamentals that are lining up just to ramp the price of uranium. And really, the only thing I could see that would, would mess us up is if uh, somebody somewhere has this big store of uranium that they've kept top secret, we don't know about and they'll start feeding that into the market but there definitely seems to be really good demand fundamentals and um, it's, it's voting really well here for the price of uranium over the next uh next while yeah, yeah okay. and and 
Sorry. Well, I just I, I want one question I ask is you know like so okay so the, the the competition has been whittled down. There's about you know like uh, Daniel was saying about fifty companies or so. Um, you know Warren and William, and this is actually for all of you. Um, how do you set up? Like, what what do you look for? Uh, what's what's the top um, uh, um, factor when looking for? Uh, investment opportunities in companies and and uh, Tim and Daniel, you know, like what what's the story that you give uh, uh, to to stand out in the in the competition? Yeah, I can start that one off if you like. I mean, for us, um, two permitted projects. They're in mining jurisdictions. Uh, one of them is in Niger, which is the fifth largest uranium jurisdiction in the world, been producing since the early nineteen seventies. It's got a government, um, 10 percent of its budget every year relies on royalty, so it's completely into uranium. And that's one of the big differences you have between those kind of jurisdictions and jurisdictions where mining is a very small part of the GDP. Uh, the restrictions on permitting things just take longer to get done when mining is part of it. Uh, we've been fortunate to have a one of the mines that's recently closed is next door to us as well, uh, the Comanac mine. So labor's there, power's there, water's there. You know, it's it's a fairly straightforward project for us to get going. So, and the other advantage of us is if the market's turning now, then, you know, by 2024, we can be into production, uh, assuming the price moves accordingly. And, and you know, that's key. We're not massive. Uh, you know, we'll produce two and a half million pounds from each of our two projects individually going through. The one thing I am getting from the utilities, um, increasing demand for diversification. Uh, they don't like having everything limited to a limited number of countries. Um, so a lot of the utility and some of them will not buy from some countries. So that cuts them out for some areas as well. So places like Africa are really getting a look see because the big utilities are saying we need to diversify. That's driven into Euro atom statements anyway. But certainly the US utilities are saying exactly the same thing. So there's a lot of space for us all to play in. Um, for us, it's about getting going. We're, we're ready to go, whereas other projects which are really good uh, may still be waiting five, 10 years from now before they turn up. Yeah. Yeah. I think that our, you know, our, our story is kind of similar in some ways, Neil's like, it's, it's all about location. It's about, you know, having the right project. So, you know, ISO energy, we're, we're located in the Eastern part of the Athabasca basin here in, in, you know, I'm sitting in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan right now. And, and, you know, Saskatchewan and, and the basin is really one of the most prolific uranium areas in the world. And so we've got a, you know, a very high grade deposit. And when you're talking, you know, in the basin, you're talking, you know, grades of, you know, upwards of hundred times the world average around, you know, from the rest of the world. So if you've got, if you've got a deposit up there and it's, it's the right kind of deposit where we're very shallow, you know, compared to other deposits, you know, just, just over 300 meters where we're in the Eastern part of the basin, which is also the infrastructure rich part of the basin. It's near the roads and the power that's been developed over the years near the, you know, the, the MacArthur rivers, the cigar Lake mines. And, and, and then we have one more real big advantage. We're 40 kilometers from the McLean Lake, uh, mill, which is uh, owned and operated by Orono, uh, the, the, you know, the, obviously the big French uh, uh, nuclear company. So those types of things are important. And then, and then that jurisdiction, you know, we uh, just, you know, recently this year, I think Saskatchewan has been, you know, seen as, you know, number one and number three by the Fraser Institute and, and other, you know, leading, you know, uh, uh, evaluators of sort of mining jurisdictions as you know one of the best jurisdictions to uh, to mine in the world. So so you, you've got all those those things those positive kind of check marks by a project like that we have uh, at ISO Energy both on the hurricane deposit our, our flagship and then all the other properties we have in that region. So those those are the things we look for to kind of set us uh, apart from some of the other uh, properties and 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 opportunities out there. I think from a public markets perspective or an investor's perspective, there's um, sort of three approaches one can take these days. Uh, there's been a growth in financial products, if you will. So uh, companies that just straight up own uranium, there are two of them. Uh, there's also an ETF or two that's focused on uranium and nuclear. Um, and then you've got sort of a choice of developers, which is Cameco or Kaz Adam Prom. Uh, and then you've got firms like WX and, and ISO Energy and uh, NextEra, uh, all of whom are developers. And so the, the public market opportunities are uh, diverse um, and can fit a number of sort of risk reward uh, preferences for investors at this point. Yeah. Uh, Did you have anything? 
Go ahead, Niels. I mean, you know, what, what's your take on, you know, like, what do you look for um, uh, in, in the uranium space? Yeah, it, it really depends on what part of the cycle you're in. Uh, I was first attracted to the uranium space. I'm more of a fundamental individual discovery type of person. I'm sort of at times a commodity agnostic, and I got involved in NextGen in a big way. I was their largest shareholder at one point. Um, which in next gen is the uh, probably the only hope for significant new production here in the next decade. Um, they they have um, you know a massive discovery uh, in their their economic in their economic uh, studies. They're they're going to be a massive producer with you know just under thirty million pounds a year. So if there's any hope for any, for this industry to kind of uh, meet demand, that, that's one of the great hopes there. So. Um, but the play it is is not not uh, not unlike what some of the other moderators have said. There there are a number of um, different ways of playing it. The two the two big boys out there are Kazataprom and and Cameco. My problem with Kazataprom is it's um, you know it's an Eastern supply. It's um, and a lot of people like I, I don't really want to invest in Kaz Kaz uh, Kazakhstan. So that's really off my list. Uh, they're a good company, but you know. They are under the influence of Russia, and uh, and I'd rather not get involved in that. And then you take a look at the next biggest producer, which is Cameco, and they've got, you know, Cigar and MacArthur. MacArthur's been going since the early 2000s, so uh, it's getting old. It's getting tired. With any mine, you mine the good stuff first, so it's getting the we're the reason you know they're they're closed now, but uh, they may reopen and. Uh, but in, in reality, these old tired mines, you mine the good stuff first. So in order to get the last stuff, it gets increasingly difficult. And we mentioned here earlier that Cigar Lake is going out of production. So that's another interesting dynamic here is that you've got uh, Western utilities. The U.S. is the largest consumer of uranium. And they're going, well, okay, you're going to have to rely on uh, uh, Kazakhstan production to fund, to, to produce energy for your consumers in the U.S. I don't think that goes over too well. And then you go, well, and the largest Western producer, well, they mothballed one of them, uh, MacArthur River, uh, and it's getting old and it's getting tired. And then the other one is going to be out of war unless they do something at the end of this decade. So, uh, you know, good luck feeding those reactors that supply a significant amount of the U.S. energy grid. Oh, yeah, and electric cars. Hey, don't worry about that. Uh, just ask Texas how the uh, wind and solar seem to work for them uh, like that, that's you're, you're, getting, you're getting ahead of me a little bit. You're getting ahead okay, of me. Okay, okay. Yeah. So okay, we'll make fun of wind and solar later. Okay, okay. I'll wait for that. I don't steal yeah, your I, thunder. I promise. <laughs> All right. And I think just uh, following on what Warren said, you know, we uh, at Massive Capital we took a slightly different bet and and we invested in Kaz Adam Prom at the IPO, which was 2018, 2019. I'm getting my years a little confused after spending a year in my house. So, um, but uh, I think, you know, there are, we like the idea of a producer who is going to pay us a dividend um, while we sat and waited. I think one of the things we can, I'm gonna put words in everyone's mouth, we can probably all agree on is that it very much looks like uranium is a bit of a, a time story, right? We're, we're sitting waiting uh, for the price to rise, the fundamentals, supply and demand are all there. And, and basically it's a time arbitrage at this point, at least that's what it looks like. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the things that was interesting about Kaz Adam prom uh, that differentiates a little bit from some of the other guys is they're going to pay you to sit and wait. And so there's probably not going to be as much pop as for example, next gen, when the price of uranium moves, there's probably going to be more pop, but on the other hand, you can sit and sort of collect some income along the way. And so again, it's, it's this interesting opportunity uh, where there's a lot of different ways to play it. Um, and so there's, uh, there's just a lot of interesting things going on in the market for investors. Yeah, yeah. And I, and maybe I'll just, uh, sorry, Niels, I was just gonna add, I mean, I think there's different ways people can look at because Adam Prom and Cameco, but at the end of the day, even if they're both you know great companies and be producing well into the future, you still need, a, you know, you can't just have two massive producers because I, I have a little different view on Cameco. I think they will produce and, and you know MacArthur will have you know quite a bit of a life once they do get it open again but um but you know the, again the 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 sector the utilities the buyers and everybody they need more than just because Adam Prom and Cameco because Warren's right and and William's right they you know the utilities and, and customers don't want to just rely and they won't rely on just you know two customers from two jurisdictions 
Yeah, and oh. Niels, can I steal some thunder from your future questions possibly? I'm not sure if you're gonna ask this. This is why I'm stealing your thunder right now. Um, so here we are, I, I think uh, from, uh, you know, your listeners could all hear that, you know, we're kind of in a pretty messed up market. And I think that's suffice to say, and we'll talk about EVs and the demand for the future, modular reactors, all the stuff in the future. But the most interesting thing I see happening here over the near term that could really bring this uh, market, uh, really turn this market around is, uh, is uh, Sprott and their acquisition of UPC. So I'm not sure, if, you know, I guess people who are following the Uranium market quite closely are aware of this, but um, that's a really exciting development. And um, I was hearing some rumors yesterday over lunch with some friends about how much uh, Uranium that this, uh, this entity, and just so your listeners know, the entity is uh, UPC, it's basically a, a fund that buys raw Uranium and stores it. And uh, they're gonna go out and they're gonna really uh, turn things on and go out there and raise money in the US and, and globally to buy spot uranium to tighten this market up. And um, like, you know, you look at other commodities, so we're, we're, we're looking at a supply demand fundamentals, which look extraordinarily compelling to begin with. And we're running uh, massive deficits that are supplied by this nefarious, rather, uh, you know, secondary supply. But now we've got funds, a UPC, and there's other ones out there, uh, uh, like, uh, like uh, yellow, yellow cake, they're, they're out there raising money in the public markets and going out there and buying buying pounds. And if UPC really gets going under Sprott's new management, uh, you know, this summer we're gonna see millions and millions of pounds being taken off the market. And that's what I'm really excited to see what happens is we'll, we'll really smoke out this secondary supply and find out how much is really there. And um, it'll be interesting to watch. So that's part of the reason yeah. I'm excited about this summer and this fall uh, and whether that'll be what it takes to get this market really rocking and rolling. Yeah. yeah, just to add into Warren's comment that, and if you guys saw this morning with Anchorage Capital coming in yeah. um, and have bought a big chunk of uh, uranium in the market, apparently several million pounds. These are the guys you know, who sold MGM cinema to Amazon. So, you know, we talk about generalists getting into the market and here we have a real generalist and not only just investing into mining, but actually buying into the physical. So clearly it's starting to get a wider audience out yeah. there and those kind of deals, uh, you know, while we've seen others buying into the commodity itself, they've generally been people in the industry. We're now That's getting right. people from outside the industry buying into the commodity, the physical itself. Yeah, Niels, maybe I, I know you want to jump in, but I'll, I'll just add one thing is just to add to that. The other piece is over the last just few weeks. I mean, there's probably been at least a billion dollars or more raised by a number of junior companies that have come in and and very kind of uniquely, you know, Denison started, Uranium uh, Energy um, Corp came in. A lot of these companies came in and, and, and raised a lot of money that just you've never seen before. Like for, for investors to come in and give that kind of money to juniors to go in and buy Uranium is really unique. And, and Warren's right, um, you know, you may not have known my background, but up until February, I was the chief commercial officer at, at Uranium Participation Corp. And so that, that change from UPC over to Sprott, really isn't you know an exciting change for the market because they will have a you know a, a, an easier road to to getting capital to going into the market and 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 buying uranium and i can tell you the industry i i maybe even underestimated the reaction a bit the 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 reaction in the industry is really significant as uh with respect to anticipating what sprout will do and what kind of impact that will have and so it will be very interesting once they finalize that deal and see what uh see what they actually do uh, with that fund. I was gonna say, you guys are making my job as moderator super easy. I, I can barely get in a question edgewise here. Um, and, that, and that was my question. I mean, obviously, you know, we saw, you know, th there's an investment case to be made in Uranium. And, and I just, I wanted to know if investors are taking advantage of that. And, and it does seem, uh, I'm, I'm surprised that, you know, billions of dollars have flooded into uh, into this market, I'm 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 genuinely surprised. Do you do you think this is just the start, or I mean, is this like you know, can, can this momentum continue? Uh, oh, absolutely. I think that one thing that we haven't mentioned yet in this conversation is the, I would almost say, radical change in geopolitics towards nuclear. If you went back 24 months ago, still you'd be struggling to get a pro nuclear story out there it was all you know when the original green deal came out in the us nuclear was not on it it was all windmills and turbine and solar panels 
And that has completely changed as everybody is setting their targets governmental wise. You know, with, there are a few exceptions of governments, uh, predominantly the Germanic states in, in, in Europe. But across the world, it's going nuclear. Everybody is writing and saying, look, we can't. We have to have the wind turbines. We've got to have the solar panels. But boy, we will not get our targets unless we keep nuclear in the story. Um, and, and that is becoming a big part of the overall picture. And that's driving the whole SMR thing. But it, what it's also doing, I think importantly for the USA, is the life extensions on reactors. I mean, reactors are supposed to be, you know, 40 year old things. Now they're getting out at eight, heading out to 80 years and potentially 100 years. So it's making nuclear when you've got a you know an extended reactor one of the cheapest forms of power that's out there and it's 100 percent clean as well uh, going forward so i think that's the other big part of this story that has really changed and is very different to where we were but even in the last cycle germany was already getting rid of its reactors they just accelerated with um fukushima this is completely different um it's a there's a massive global swing towards it yeah, you're right. And it, it, go ahead, Niels. I'll let them. Actually, I just I wanted to I wanted to 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 uh, you know I gotta, I gotta do my job somehow. Um, <laughs> I, let's let's talk about how nuclear fits in with this this green energy transformation. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll let I'll, I'll let the floodgates open if you want to uh, if you want to uh, throw some shade on on wind and uh, wind and solar. But yeah, like how does how does nuclear fit in with this with this revolution that we're seeing now okay can i jump in i want to start making fun of wind and solar first <laughs> but kim you stole a bit of the thunder there like right. let's 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 look at this rationally going forward here like like we, you know we've explained to all your listeners all the the fundamentals and how they're looking really really good even before the whole the whole electrification of the world like the world's being electrified right we're getting off we're trying our best to get off fossil fuels. Well, guess what? Um, we can't power our economies on fairy dust here. We need reality, right? We need we need power. We need non-CO2 generating power. So we can't burn thermal coal. Um, and Texas has proven that you know, you know, wind and wind and solar are just not there. I live in Canada, and you know, um, I'm here in Vancouver now on business. But in Vancouver, I was here lived here as a kid. It would rain for a month straight and we're talking there wasn't a lot of wind and there was no solar so a month like what do you do can you store the city of vancouver's power for a month in some sort of battery somewhere uh that was generated in the few sunny days during the summer like it is completely outrageous that we're thinking we're going to power our world with wind and solar and even looking at wind wind turbines the lifespan is not that long they, they fall apart and you have to throw them in landfills they're, they're not an answer they're stone age technology um, and you're looking at solar, well, it has applications, but it's not going to be grid power that you could power your factories and your economies and your EVs. You need good, reliable baseload power. We've already dammed up all our rivers. We're not going to be burning thermal coal. What else is there? Well, there's only one option. It's nuclear power at the present time. Sure, there might be in the future, uh, you know, some uh, fusion reactors and all sorts of other space age stuff, but today... Uh, and going forward in our in our near term here in our lifetime, it'll be fission reactors and it'll be modular fission reactors where they're able to standardize the parts. It brings down the capital cost of these reactors. But the future for nuclear, like Kim says, is super exciting. And finally, the world has stopped listening to Al Gore about you know wind and solar, and they're saying, okay, well we let's get real here. We got to really power this earth. So let's get on the, the nuclear bandwagon and people are figuring that out. And when they're working on the safety issues, even with the existing technology, nuclear has been safer than every other form of baseload power. Uh, less people have been killed with uh, nuclear power than uh, obviously coal is an easy one that kills you know thousands, tens of thousands of people a year as a result of the pollution. But even if you take a look at hydro, like there's enough hydro dams that break killing people that the, they're less safe than nuclear. Nuclear has been the safest uh, in, uh, form of baseload power, and it's been quietly generating power the last 50 years, and um, and it's going to power our future. And we've, I think, more and more people are figuring that one out. 
Yeah, I'd love to hear from William on this. He's, he's yeah. been quiet here for uh, for a little bit. So yeah, so I, I think as we continue to roll out timelines with specific dates, so for example, decarbonizing the US electrical grid by 2035. Um, the significance and importance of nuclear to the grid just increases, right? So when we had the first, uh, whatever, 2015, the, the Paris Accords, the first time around, if you will, and people's uh, nationally defined contributions, what they were going to sort of decarbonize, um, people were saying all sorts of things. And, and you could, you know, there are no timelines really, except for 2050. And that's so far away that, you know, politician can sort of say anything. Um, but now when you start to sort of pull the timelines in and you start talking 2035, 2030, uh, the role and significance of nuclear and the inability uh, to just sort of swap everything out on the grid with uh, wind and solar becomes apparent. And I think you can look now also at several sort of case studies, if you will. So, for example, Germany, uh, you know, around Fukushima, they said they were going to phase out all their nuclear, and they've now invested significantly in wind and energy or wind and solar. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is they've uh, over the last 10 years, you know, their carbon emissions have largely, you know, are largely unchanged in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and that's because they swapped out one zero carbon source of power nuclear for uh, two others, wind and solar. And so, you know, they sort of spent 10 years uh, significant capital uh, and, you know, haven't really made all that much progress. Uh, if your goal is, for example, again, decarbonizing the grid by 2035, uh, you just can't do it with the tools we've got. Um, and you just can't do it with the capital that's available. Uh, if we had unlimited capital, sure, you could just slap lithium ion batteries next to each other till the end of time, perhaps, but there isn't unlimited capital, there isn't unlimited lithium, nickel, et cetera. Uh, and so it's, it's just not really feasible um, or sustainable uh, economically or environmentally uh, to think that we can just decarbonize the grid over the next 10, 15, or even 20 years without using nuclear. It's just not, it's not practical. Um, so, and, and when you get down to brass tacks, it has to be economically, environmentally sustainable, and it's got to be practical. And if it's not those sort of three things, uh, it's, you know, just a plan on paper or a plan that someone put together on an Excel spreadsheet, and that's just not going to work. Um, and yeah, I, I think, think the environmentalists are maybe hopefully waking up to this a little bit. Uh, you still have examples sort of like Indian Point in New York, where it appears that they haven't quite figured out that uh, you can't sort of do this, um, this decarbonization without nuclear, but I, I think those cases are becoming fewer and far between. I, I think yeah, the yeah. other thing that the, I, uh, the, the, the people forget, there are 830 million people in this world who have no access to power at this point. Um, and they need power. Um, you look at Africa, Africa's problem is it grows its power and uh, its population grows faster than its power growth. Um, so you've got to find a way of those kind of areas to get development going. Power's got to jump ahead um, and give that growth that's needed to get those kind of developing regions to get moving on. And, you know, and here lies one of the problems. Nuclear actually uses less physical elements, metals, than the other two by a very large margin. Wind and solar are big consumers of metal across the world. And so, you know, environmentally, you then look at the footprint that comes through from wind and solar. There's just a lot of big mines that got to be built somewhere, whether they're copper mines, et cetera, they've got to come in and replace. The other thing I hadn't realized until recently, 95% of a nuclear reactor is recyclable. So actually, when you dismantle the thing, there's not a lot left, uh, it disappears. The other thing is that we've been talking a lot about power, grid power here, but 30% of a nuclear reactor's energy is never consumed at the moment, which is the heat that comes off it. It is very effective for the production of hydrogen and desalination. Uh, and that is where the world is going as well, from putting hydrogen into natural gas, green steel, these kind of things need hydrogen. There was a fascinating number I saw the other day looking at Europe. It wants to produce enough hydrogen which consume 40 gigawatts of power. To do that with solar, they would have to cover 8 million hectares of ground to put that in. They could do that with a nuclear reactor. So this is the difference that you've got going on, that there are other industries other than just grid power, where nuclear is highly effective of, of greenifying it, 
which solar and wind cannot do. So it's got a much bigger mandate out there, uh, which is starting to be recognized as well. And people might, you know, push back and say, well, well, it's very hard to build a nuclear power plant from a, a siting perspective. Um, but just like it uses less metals uh, than, say, uh, solar and, and wind, uh, it also uses significantly less land. Um, and one of the challenges that a lot of countries are having currently, and again, a perfect example is Germany, um, in terms of citing uh, onshore wind, uh, they have fallen well behind their targets. Uh, they are almost at this point, they can't reach their 2030 targets uh, unless they you know, double, triple, quadruple the amount of onshore wind that they're building. But the fact of the matter is no one wants it in their backyard. So uh, you might say nobody wants nuclear in their backyard either, but of course, you know, if it's nobody wants anything in their backyard. So it's sort of a bit of a push at this point between the two. Uh, and in terms of, of land use and interconnections, there are these other variables uh, that wind and solar have. Um, and, you know, massive capital, we're strong proponents of wind and solar, but the fact of the matter is you need to have a balanced slate. Um, we need to have reliability. If Texas teaches us anything, it's that reliability has you know tremendous value add, uh, and you just don't necessarily get that reliability without a diversified portfolio. Uh, and two two sources of energy is not a diversified portfolio. Um, I do. We do need to uh, wrap this up. I wanted to ask one last question, and uh, we are running out of time, so may, um, let's uh, maybe keep our answers brief so everybody can ask. Um, there's been a lot of a bullish forecast for prices this year. I just wanted to, to find out from you guys, where do you think uh, uranium goes to? I mean, do you think we, we end the year uh, above 50? Um, you know, what gets us to the, the two, 2007 uh, all-time highs, if, if that's uh, possible? Whoever, whoever wants to start first. Who wants to start with that one? Listen, I'll, I'll start, uh, then Neil's... Uh, uh, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm bold enough to throw a number out there. All, all I can say is, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, when I look at it, all this fundamentals, all the signposts around uranium and nuclear are looking incredibly good. So, you know, the fundamentals we talked about, um, you know, th they speak for themselves. You've got the the climate change narrative that's growing, which is incredible. And and then just this whole piece around, you know, ESG and the fact that uranium companies are now being seen as a positive ESG you know, investment. I think all those things are just pointing towards, you know, uranium, um, you know, having a very good, uh, having a good, very good period ahead. And, and, you know, as far as it going, you know, up to where it did back in the 06, 07, you know, it, it may, I guess, there's always the possibility, you know, the, the, the situation has changed a bit. Back then there wasn't a Kazadam prom, you know, with, with this, you know, uh, production that, that can kind of moderate things. But I think what you'll have is, is you, you, the bottom line is you need you need other entrants into into the market just like you don't you can't have you know two sources of, of power to have a diversified power you know grid you can't have two you know big big producer uranium and, and that's it you need you need some other entrants coming in you've got the next gens coming in uh, you know who are obviously you know going to be very important Dennis and other others that are developing projects but there's a lot of room uh, because there's going to be a lot of demand for uranium. Um, in the future, the existing from utilities, but also as, as Warren pointed out earlier, there's a lot of growth going on as well. It's slow. It's not. It's not this you know crazy you know twenty percent growth a year, but it's this one and a half two percent growth every year, and we can see it coming coming because you can't hide the the building of a nuclear power plant. You can see it coming down the road, and so I think times ahead for uh, the uranium and uranium price are very good. Uh, I'll yeah, try I, to keep I'm, I'm not gonna keep miles are shorter than that one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I jumped in first. <laughs> uh, the one comment I'll say is we saw a price spike last year with COVID where it was reported up to 34, but the reality is two of the converters, the price only ever got up to about 31, 30, 31. The difference this time is that all four conversion sites, the three conversion sites are moving together in sync. So you do not have this separation. We've seen slow, steady price. I think we're going to see that for the rest of this year. I'd like to see a price between certainly getting close to 40 by the end of this year. And I think that's from here doable. I'm, I'm not gonna throw out a, a price target for the end of the year or anything, but I, what I will say is that um, our research, and I'm sure some of you guys can confirm this, uh, 
in order to actually sort of turn on a new mine or for Cameco to say, bring back some of their mines, you need prices of anywhere from 40 to $60. And I think producers and developers are gonna wanna see that uh, for an extended period of time. Um, I don't know if that's six months or 12 months, um, but you know, a price spike to 40 followed quickly by a, a you know, fall back to 30 is not gonna do it. Uh, so a sustained price uh, above 40, above 45, um, for six to 12 months uh, is going to be needed uh, in order to bring new mines online. And until new mines come online, the market's not going to balance. Uh, so you can sort of look forward to uh, on some unknown timeline, admittedly, which is why it's time arbitrage in our opinion, uh, prices north of 40 and, and you know between that 40 and $60 range. Yeah, I guess you get to have the last say. Yeah, to bring it all together, uh, I'll say, uh... I'm going to be a, to say a little bit more, be a little bit more out there as far as things, you know, this, I'll take a look at the last uranium cycle. <clears throat> Many of the things that happened the last uranium cycle are happening this cycle. We had the big investors moving in, buying all the uranium companies. You'll notice that if you, the uranium companies are reasonably expensive right now. And people are asking, Warren, why are these uranium companies moving up yet? The price of spot really hasn't moved a huge amount. I said, because Big, big, big smart money is moving in and getting positioned in the stocks. What's the next step in this whole uranium cycle? Is big money like uh, the money Sprott's going to raise, like these these uh, people men Tim had mentioned coming in? There will be billions of dollars being jammed into the spot uranium market, and I don't think the utilities have any idea what's going to happen here because they've been spoiled with years and years of having this secondary supply coming at them. We could see a scenario where we have a massive spike in the price of uranium, and that would be basically as a result of UPC and other major players continuing. And instead of raising 50 million, 20 million, 30 million, they'll be raising a billion or two billion bucks, jamming it into the spot market. And guess what? We'll find out how much secondary supply there really is. And when that gets going, and then all of a sudden you get the herd mentality of the utilities running in to try and cover and to buy and realizing they're, they're a little short uranium and they need to get some, and they don't want the lights to go out in their cities. Um, it could be pandemonium. That's the pandemonium scenario, but that scenario is out there. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but a lot of things are happening or pointing in that direction that it could be a little bit of pandemonium. We won't see the steady eddy inc increase. We could see pandemonium in this market with massive amounts of capital cleaning out the spot market. You got chemical going in buying, UPC buying, big US investors stepping up buying. And if, if, if like a lot of people are thinking we're gradually soaking up this secondary supply, then we'll be looking at a many tens of millions of pounds deficit. And that is insane, frankly, in, in the market. You, you look at any other commodities, oil, you, you see what oil does when there's a uh, 100 million barrels of production and 101 million barrels of demand. Oil spikes like crazy. Well, you could imagine if there's, you know, 180 million pounds of demand and there's only 120 million pounds of, of supply and the secondary market's been just cleaned up by these third parties have just stepped into the market. That's the pandemonium scenario and it's, it's a possibility. Gentlemen, I'm, I'm a gold guy, but uh, I have to say after this discussion, uh, you've got me interested in, uh, in uranium. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I hope everybody else uh, enjoyed the, the insights. Thank you.